Right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name's Jane McClarty. I'm your compere for this evening. And welcome to the 14th Disability Lecture. Uh, Marvellous to think it's been going on for 14 years. It seems like, I don't know about you, I, I, I see some familiar faces here that I think have possibly come to all 14. Uh, but it seems like yesterday since the first one to me. Um, I should thank the organisers. So thank you to the Equality and Diversity section of the university. And thank you to the DRC, the Disability Resource Centre team that's organised this and all the other lectures. And especially to, to Kirsty, who masterminds the details of, of the admin so wonderfully. I should just make the usual announcement that we are not expecting the fire alarm to go off. And so if it does go off, the exits are on either side. And for those who can at the, uh, make it to the top of the stairs, there are exits at the top of the stairs too. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Sakib Sheikh, who is our speaker for this evening. Sakib is a, as a software engineer who's currently working for Microsoft in the Artificial Intelligence and Research Group. Um, Sakib was drawn to computers by the independence uh, they, they gave him, and he went on to read computer science at Essex University. So during his 11 years at, at Microsoft, Sakib has worked on a variety of products and has assisted several groups with building more inclusive software he also continually tinkers on side projects, <laughs> often focusing on empowering people with visual impairments to do more. So Sakib tonight is talking to us about innovating towards a more inclusive future. So let's welcome him tonight. Well, thank you very much for inviting me to speak here tonight. It's an honor to be speaking at such a prestigious event in such a grand environment. The last time I was here at the University of Cambridge was many, many years ago when I was still at school visiting a friend. Wow, so much has changed. <laughs> As you heard, I'm a software engineer. I like making things that help people. I'm also blind and recently, I got to put these two things together. And at Microsoft, I've been working on researching how artificial intelligence can be used to provide someone who is blind or visually impaired with more information about their visual environment. And that brings me to the topic of this lecture tonight, innovating towards a more inclusive future. For me, Technology has been a big part of my life ever since I was a kid. I went to a school for uh, visually impaired kids, New College Worcester. For me, that was an amazing environment. It helped me to learn to be independent, and it really took disability off the table. It was a great environment. But now, looking back, I realize just how much was going on behind the scenes to make everything just so. So many hardworking teachers and support workers. And a bunch of technology too, whether that was the, all the different, I guess you'd call them assistive technologies, whether that's screen readers and magnifiers on the computers, or the machines that made all the tactile diagrams that let me feel all the maps of the world that I could never understand quite. <laughs> or, or all the different gadgets that we had that spoke. And so it was in that environment that I got hooked on tech initially. I learned to program and had a couple of invaluable mentors, older students, who both, in fact, actually studied computer science at Cambridge here at St. John's College. Later, when I was at university, I realized just how involved it can be to make things truly accessible. I, if there are any students in the audience tonight, you may be familiar with this. You know, you have to make sure that, you know, you have lecture notes in the format which is accessible to you. And 
I had to like, you know, scan my books in. But unfortunately, technical books, even then and still today, are not as easy to access as they should be. So I had to have a crew of people reading things out to me. And that's how I got through university, and I did well. But it was interesting challenges. And I remember this one point I'd like to share with you in particular. It was right at the beginning of my first year. And I had to do this compulsory hardware course, which was even less accessible than most. <laughs> right, I'm a software guy. How to do hardware, right? <laughs> so none of the notes are accessible. None of the software is accessible. So I have to get one of my readers to sit next to me to do everything. And I go through the course, but just imagine someone sitting next to me, and they're reading me these circuit diagrams. <laughs> and they're saying, there's this, connects to this, there's a line here, connects to this. And I'm trying to get this all in my head, and then I'm like, OK, change this. What happened? And then they're telling me, OK, now this connects to this. And this. It was an awful course to have to do. <laughs> but I got through it. And I, I just remember there was this one point, it's a vivid memory that stays with me. I called home, and I was having a bit of rant to mum. I was like, you know, everything's rubbish, don't like anything. You know? <laughs> <laughs> how am I going to get through this course? How am I ever going to have a career in this industry if this is how inaccessible it is? And something my mum said, you know, she calmed me down in the way mums do. <laughs> But then she said, you know, you're a programmer. You make things. Maybe one day you'll make something that makes this easier for you and for others. And maybe that's obvious. But to my 18-year-old self, it was something of an epiphany. That, wow, maybe one day I could use technology, the same technology which is so inaccessible now, but use technology to solve problems for myself. And that was something that really stuck with me. So then I went on into industry. And for the first many years, 10 years plus, I, I didn't want to make accessibility or blindness part of my job. Nothing wrong with that. But for me personally, I wanted to prove to myself and everyone else that I could be successful in the mainstream industry. And I guess I, another story related to that. When I was at school, there was a competition, I, yeah, an engineering competition, and I'd made a Braille translator. And there was this big do at the Millennium Dome. That dates me a bit. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we're at the Millennium Dome, big do, um, and there's several judges walking around all the different tables. and. I'm really excited to meet the CEO of some, uh, quite a well-known company. And he came around, and he's, uh, you know, he seemed quite complimentary, quite interested. But then just as he's leaving, he's like, you know what? You'll never make any money from this. You'd be better off just making Braille by the hour. <laughs> and that's sort of his parting shot. <laughs> I was like, ouch. <laughs> and I think that also. So yes, when I went into industry, I wanted to prove that. <coughs> I'm going to make it in the mainstream. But I always had these side projects at Microsoft, helping out a number of teams with making the software more inclusive, as you heard, or you know, solving different accessibility problems. That's always been a side passion of mine over all those years. And then a few years ago, an interesting opportunity arose to make this uh, to make this part of my job, well, let me tell you. So Microsoft, about three years ago, had its first ever hackathon. Now, I don't, this was an opportunity for all the 100,000 plus employees around the world to hack on whatever interested them, uh, whether that was technical or pr other processes. And I don't mean like, you know, hackers like in the Hollywood movies. <laughs> you know, all the bad villains. This is more the original word, like to tinker, to solve problems. 
So faced with this incredibly, incredible opportunity to spend a few days of whatever interested me, I thought, what am I going to do? And again, I came back to a memory from university days. It's funny how so many things start there. Um, there was a friend and I in our bedrooms sitting late at night discussing, wow, you know, wouldn't it be great to have a pair of sunglasses with a camera on? And then there'd be a computer, and it would do stuff. And then that stuff would tell you everything that's around you. OK, that was you know, the dreams of teenagers. But I realized that you know, that's still a far off dream. But some small part of that might already be possible today. So that's what I did for the hackathon project. And I'll come back to that later. But that's, that theme stayed with me, this idea of solving problems that were relevant to me. And in other, other hackathons, I worked on projects like, how do you represent data in audio? Like whether that's graphs or you know, using a touch screen to investigate data through audio. Or one year, I got together with a hardware hacker, because I was going to do it myself. So I found a hardware guy to put an ultrasound sensor on my cane and have it vibrate, depending on how far things were. <laughs> so that's just to tell you that this is a crazy environment, that um, it was a privilege to be able to work on these things. But going back to that first year, what really impressed me is while there were so many business projects at that hackathon, as you'd imagine, around productivity and uh, the internet, there were a number of projects related to disability. And you saw this trend of people who were disabled themselves or uh, knew someone or just had an interest coming together with a team to solve that problem. One incredible project that year was um, the Eye Gaze project. It was inspired by Steve Gleason, who's a former NFL, American football, that is, uh, player. He has ALS, motor neuron disease. And he wrote Microsoft an email saying, you know, I challenge you to find solutions to these problems. Like, you know, how can I better communicate with my wife? And so a team came together inspired by that email. And they made some incredible things in a short amount of time in the spirit of sort of tinkering and not necessarily making products, but you know, just investigating and coming up with prototypes. And they mounted a tablet PC in front of his wheelchair. And along with an eye tracker, so now you have a piece of software which can see roughly where the user is looking on the screen. And you can have a keyboard which predicts the text, kind of like you have on your mobile phone, but for eye gaze. And that enable, would enable someone to type faster and as a result speak faster too, which is really cool. And then they took that and I thought, OK, what if you could drive a wheelchair using eye gaze, steer a wheelchair, I should say, using eye gaze too? I think the team could describe this way better than I can. So I've got a video to show you. Steve Gleason wrote an email. He said, I want to be able to move my wheelchair. I want to be independent. I want to be able to have great conversations with my kiddo. I did have the harebrained idea that users like me should be able to drive their wheelchairs with their eyes. A small team of innovators accepted the challenge. Hackathons can be a really a good way for you to get your brain out of where you are, go to some place, invent some new thing. At the end of the hackathon, we had kind of a baseline eye gaze keyboard, and then for the wheelchair, we had something that was very cobbled together, and we barely got it working right when Steve was there. But it was really cool to be able to see the look in his eye of just like, wow, this is actually a possibility. Before it was a pipe dream, and now this could actually work. 
We did not want it to be it at the end of the hackathon at all. By then, we had all vehemently fallen in love with Steve and his family. We wanted to continue this project. We saw the impact that this technology can have, and we just got excited about it, and we were fortunate to get the resources together and move forward. So Steve didn't know what to expect. Within a few weeks, Microsoft had a prototype. Within a few months, they were on their way to New Orleans to hook up his chair with the eye control technology. Steve Gleason is a force of nature. He's honest with us, he's direct, and he's very specific about what has gone wrong and what he thinks we need to do to improve the system. Currently, there are still no treatments for the disease, but because of technology, people like me are able to remain productive and purposeful for years, even decades. To see him be able to chase his son around his house, he wasn't able to do that before. That was more than just powerful. It was a life changer. All the things that he wants to do with his son are the things that I want to do with my kids. So knowing that we've been able to play even a really tiny role in that has been incredible. We have been really working to take the technology into something that could be not just something that we give Steve, but something that we're able to take to a much broader set of people. A lot of the people that we get to talk with and work with, some have passed away. We're against a clock, and we know that. I hate ALS with every fiber of my being, but the advantage to doing this work was it allows us to unify around a common good and around what's really important. Technology has transformed my life, and I know we're going to transform thousands of other people's lives in the near future. When the day comes, remember, you saw it here first. A group of researchers within Microsoft is taken that original hack and is carrying on with the research. But I must stress, this is just research. It's just in the lab. And you know, just want to be super clear that this is not product. It's not something that's out there today. But it's great to be able to share this early work with you. I think the key point here for me is that it takes Someone with knowledge, passion for disability coming together with the creators to solve problems and make these solutions which can be so empowering. It doesn't necessarily require a big organization. And you know, that might sound funny coming from someone at Microsoft, but you know, to solve small problems, you don't need a big organization. You don't need someone to give you permission. It just, um, I'm very passionate, and I've seen this you know, at different scales. It just requires, you have all the techies who have all these skills to make things. And then you have people with very personal challenges that maybe they would like solutions to. And if you bring these groups together, then really great stuff happens. So on that theme, the following year, there was a different team. And they decided to make tools to make it easier for people with learning differences to use some of the Microsoft products. They made an extension to the OneNote product, which is for taking notes. And they, incorporate, they got together with special education teachers and students and researchers and put in some features, such as the ability to listen to a document read out while simultaneously highlighted, thus using two of your senses. Or also um, adjusting the font size and spacing <coughs> to reduce visual crowding. And also showing different types of words, like verbs and nouns, in different colors. These are all techniques which have been shown to um, aid in reading speed and comprehension. Again, I think the team can describe this really well. So um, let's see another video. What did we start talking about yesterday, guys? St. Patrick's Day! I am a resource special education teacher. I target groups of students who need intervention for either reading, language arts, or math. 
These are kids that struggle every day. And to watch them grow and learn and have those aha moments oh, now I get it. is so rewarding to me and it just makes my heart soar. We have ADHD, dyslexia, dysgraphia. I have a student who reads on a third grade level, but then I have a student who reads on a kindergarten level, and I have to find a way to bridge the gap. We've been using OneNote since the beginning of this school year. Even in this short amount of time that we've had it, it's been completely transformational. When we first started using OneNote, I thought, okay, this is gonna take us a while to get going, and you know, we're gonna have to learn how to use it. Mm -hmm. Three days. It took them three days to master OneNote. I have a dyslexic student who's also dysgraphic. He still reads on a kindergarten level. You know, he's 10 years old, he's still learning sight words. And, you know, he would tell me all the time that he was stupid. When we started this school year, he read four words per minute. For the longest time, I struggled with how to help him. And when we got the learning tools with the immersive reader, he went to 22 words per minute. I never thought in one calendar school year that we would even get into double digits and he's at 22 words per minute and he stayed there. For my students especially, it's really transformed their educational experience. I don't know what next year will look like. I don't know what our possibilities are because in my wildest dreams, I never thought this would be what it is. You know, the sky's the limit. Wow, four to 22 words a minute is really, really incredible. And I must apologize uh, for the visually impaired people in the audience. I know there's no audio description, uh, but hopefully the dialogue is good enough for that. You can always, I'm always happy to answer questions later. So as it started, um, even though it started as a hackathon project, learning tools actually went on to ship as part of a Microsoft product, initially in OneNote, and also some parts of it in Microsoft Word as well. So that's available today. But the features they develop, we found, were not only useful for people with learning differences. They're also useful to, for example, people who learning English as a second language. And in actual fact, they can aid anyone in increasing their reading speed and comprehension. And that brings me to this idea of inclusive design. It's a design methodology being adopted by many teams across Microsoft. Whenever a designer designs a product or service, there's some inherent bias. But if you recognize what the bias is and who you're excluding with that design, then in fact, you can embrace diversity and find peoples that who would be excluded using this inclusive design methodology. And then you focus in on individuals. And if you solve the problems for uh, individuals with disabilities, then in actual fact, we find often that you're creating a better design for everyone. You can say, solve for one, extend to many. A really nice example of this is Skype Translator. This is a product which allows two people speaking different languages to communicate. For example, if I'm speaking, well, I speak English, but <laughs> <laughs> if I want to talk to a friend who's in France, for example, I might say hello. And the system trans recognizes what I said and translates it to French and speaks out loud, bonjour, but in a proper French accent. <laughs> So very early on in the development of this technology, an engineer, Ted Hart, heard about this and had a great idea. Ted is hard of hearing, and he thought he's not been able to make a telephone call. So he thought, what if I could read what the other person was saying? 
So using that same technology in this core Skype translator, the team got to work and built some features so that it can now translate from uh, one language to the same language, like English to English. But one party can either be typing instead of speaking or reading instead of listening, depending on their preferences. And there's some other interesting features too, like the ability to have live transcription so that um, someone who's reading can interrupt the person who's speaking. Again, let me hand it over to Ted on a video to describe some more. When I was 13 years old, I lost my hearing when I got the mumps. As you can imagine, this makes it difficult to communicate with people. When I met my future wife, she was able to communicate with me only by spelling out letters on my hand. A month later, we met again and I found out that she had taught herself the alphabet. This was a successful strategy because we've been married now for 19 years. Last uh, fall, Ted had come to my office to tell me about an idea that he had for adapting Skype Translator to a scenario that would actually be useful to him. Ted, being deaf, can't make calls over Skype. But with Skype Translator, because it produces transcripts, he could actually read the response back from someone. So we sat down and talked about it for a little bit, and there were some pieces missing in Skype Translator, so we needed to actually do something to make it more appropriate for that scenario. Ted Hart is requesting an automatically translated call. I usually need to have an ASL interpreter for my meetings at work. It means that meetings have to be planned in advance, and sometimes this isn't always possible. It doesn't replace an ASL interpreter, but it gives me a lot of other options when one can't be able to reach the last minute. Although these features were really impactful for Ted in his work life, what really hit me was the realization that there was a big impact on his personal life. I realized that using Skype Translator, I could call my wife directly for the first time. There are relay services that you can use, but they are inconvenient and require time to initiate the call. With Skype Translator, I just read the transcript and I understand what she is saying. It's really cool that 24 years after she learned sign language to enter my world, I can take a more full step into hers. So I was sitting back thinking about this and looking at it and realizing the impact that this could have for me, for people here at Microsoft, and for our customers, for people with deafness, with hard of hearing all over the world. Technology has that power. It can empower people to do things and make things easier. It's available now. Download it, give it a try, and help us to make this a better and better product. So as you heard, that's actually gone into the product and is available today. And again, these features are not just for people with disabilities. You can imagine that something like this would be really useful if you're in an environment where you can't speak. For example, you're on a bus, or where it's difficult to hear, like a noisy environment. And I think that's the key to inclusive design. I've been talking a lot about current prototypes from Microsoft. That's obviously the world that I um, live in uh, for many years. But great work like this is going on all around the world and has for many years. And it's interesting to take a look back at history to see where do some of these technologies come from. With Skype, we saw technologies like speech recognition and text-to-speech. Those are both technologies originally designed to help people with disabilities, and yet they're mainstream in every phone all over the place today. So we see that technologies originally inspired by disability can become part of the mainstream. My favorite story about something like that is about the now famous scientist Ray Kurzweil. Back in the 70s, at the, early on in his career, he was on an airplane journey, sitting next to a blind man. And he said, if I could invent anything, what would it be? And the man said, I'd like something that would let me read books. This is in the 70s. And so that's what Ray Kurzweil did. Incredibly, he built a machine the size of a washing machine, <laughs> costing tens of thousands of dollars. 
But yeah, it would read a book. And in doing that, he also invented some other technologies, like flatbed scanners and text-to-speech. So again, we're seeing this idea of those specialist technologies becoming mainstream too. And that takes me full circle. The successor to that uh, big uh, reading machine is you know, the ability to scan books, as I was telling you at the beginning in the, what I was using throughout my education. And back to my journey. At the very first hackathon, I developed a very prototype of the app that would let you take a picture and tell you something about what's in it. I continued working on that project, tinkering on the side, and made several prototypes, and got in touch with some people in Silicon Valley interested in solving that problem too. So we formed a team and hacked some more, and eventually got to work on it full time, and I found my dream job. That was great. And so, in a moment, I'll show you some of our research. But to describe, it's still at the early phases. We can, we can get some information about what's in a picture, but we can't like describe videos in real time. But if given an image, a snapshot, we have technology that can detect a few of the objects in it, or maybe their relation, or the um, text and people in the image as well. So that's what I'm continuing to work on. And we made a video showing an early prototype, along with which I think is going to convey the vision for the future as well. So let's see that. I'm Sakib Sheikh. I lost my sight when I was seven. And shortly after that, I went to a school for the blind. And that's where I was introduced to talking computers. And that really opened up a whole new world of opportunities. I joined Microsoft 10 years ago as a software engineer. I love making things which improve people's lives. And one of the things I've always dreamt of since I was at university was this idea of something that could tell you at any moment what's going on around you. I think it's a man jumping in the air doing a trick on a skateboard. I teamed up with like-minded engineers to make an app which lets you know who and what is around you. It's based on top of the Microsoft Intelligence APIs, which makes it so much easier to make this kind of thing. The app runs on smartphones, but also on the pivot head smart glasses. When you're talking to a bigger group, sometimes you can talk and talk and there's no response and you think, is everyone listening really well? Or are they half asleep? And you never know. I see two faces, 40 year old man with a beard looking surprised. 20-year-old woman looking happy. The app can describe the general age and gender of the people around me and what their emotions are, which is incredible. One of the things that's most useful about the app is the ability to read out text. Hello, good afternoon. Here's your menu. Great, thank you. I can use the app on my phone to take a picture of the menu, and it's going to guide me on how to take that correct photo. Move camera to the bottom right and away from the document. And then it'll recognize the text. Read me the headings. I see appetizers, salads, paninis, pizzas, pastas. Hi. Years ago, this was science fiction. I never thought it would be something that you could actually do. But artificial intelligence is improving at an ever faster rate. And I'm really excited to see where we can take hey. this. <laughs> As engineers, we're always standing on the shoulders of giants building on top of what went before. And in this case, we've taken years of research from Microsoft Research to pull this off. I think it's a young girl throwing an orange frisbee in the park. For me, it's about taking that far off dream and building it one step at a time. I think this is just the beginning. So weird to hear myself. <laughs> 
but I hope that conveys some of the vision of what our research project is, is all about. I really hope that we can you know, take some of that vision and build more and more pieces, add more building blocks as artificial intelligence improves. And it's incredible the things we can achieve today. And I can't wait to sort of keep adding more and more to that. So, and yeah, I feel honored to be able to work in this field. And so to close, I, to close, I hope I've given you an idea of how I believe that technology really can power people. In, technology is really powerful for people with disabilities, sorry. And really, all it takes sometimes is for the right people to come together. People with knowledge of a problem coming together with the creators. And here at Cambridge, you have world-class computer science and engineering departments. And so if there's anyone with a disability, I'd encourage you, go find your local creator. And you never know what you could come up with. Thank you. Saki, thank you so much for that. That was, that was absolutely fascinating. And I'm going to abuse my privilege now, sitting up here by asking the first question. Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty of others. Um, if I were to ask you what, you know, what would be the thing you would invent, if you could invent anything, <laughs> what would your answer be? As I say, I, am, I feel really lucky to be able to work on the current research project. So mm. it would be something that furthers this idea of telling you who and what is around you. Mm. And I think they're just all these small little problems um, we face in our daily lives. And I'd like to just take them and solve them one at a time. In terms of thinking, what's the first? I don't know. Maybe finding an empty seat on a train might be one to start <laughs> with. <laughs> Thank you. Right. Are, are there questions out there who would like to... Uh, the lady, the, there's a microphone coming to you. Thank you. And that was a lovely talk. Thanks very much. So one thing that I've noticed people have talked about with accessible technology is that the, a lot of the model for funding is these bespoke technologies that are often very expensive and are hard for folks with disabilities to pay for. And that things like smartphones that now have accessibility often aren't covered by things like assistance uh, funds and so on. Do you think that's something that's going to change as we have more technology moving onto platforms that everybody uses? That's a tough one. So if I understand correctly, we're talking about this idea of you do need these specialist assistive technologies because a lot of research goes into these and they're, they're very tailor-made. But then at the same time, you maybe have the more inclusive design approach of different features and I know some people talk of this like, you know, a menu of customizing, for example, a phone or other device to the way you use it. And sometimes for, for many people, that would be enough. And often the cost is low enough to be able to afford. But then sometimes I think you also need those very specialist technologies too. I hope that answers your question. Right, the lady in, in red there. There's a microphone coming to your right, I think. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. That was a really interesting talk. This isn't a question, it's just a comment. Um, this lecture is part of the Cambridge Science Festival. And one of the things, we've been to a lot of lectures. It was wonderful to see somebody using sign language. But this is the first time, and this is nearly the end of a fortnight, we've been to at least two lectures every evening and a lot at the weekend, and there hasn't been one that has had sign language. So if the powers could be, could communicate with the powers that be that organise the Cambridge Science Festival, I think it's really important that at every lecture it's accessible to people who are hard of hearing. 
Right, gentleman up there in the black shirt. Just on the point of history, what, uh, what group of people with disabilities do you think wrote the book, wrote the initial book when it comes to developing technology? Wow. <laughs> I'm not well versed enough with all the history as to, you know, which group. Being blind myself, I, I definitely know that route way better, but I, I, I'm trying to think of a smart answer here. <laughs> cool. Right. I think we're going to take another yeah. question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> that was a very difficult question. <laughs> Thank you. And, anyway, right, o over there, John, with a scarf. Thank Thanks for the talk. Really like that, Saqib. Um, you kind of mentioned something and then um, didn't come back to it, so I wonder if I could push on it further. You talked about a project that you did representing data with audio. Could you give us a bit of, I don't know, colour or information about what that kind of was and how it worked? Sure. Um, it was a bit of an experiment. So I, ha so I had this idea, and it's not the first time. A lot of people have a sort of experiment with what you'd call sonification is the technical word. But a simple example is if you have a line graph, you could represent the x-axis with duration and the y-axis with pitch. So you could play this sound which you know, goes up and down in, in pitch. But then we sort of, I was playing around with different ideas. For example, could you then use touch screens to interrogate that more? Or could you uh, speak and ask questions and get the computer to do some of that analysis for you. And then, you know, we experiment with different audio things like, um, if you have a scatter graph, then maybe representing different points by the computer speaking in different ways. So it's very experimental, but I hope that gives you an idea. Another question? Yes. Right. Um, I'm involved with um, helping a blind lady climb on a climbing wall. And the cl climbing wall is a very artificial environment because you climb from colored hold to colored hold. And it seemed to me that your app would be amazing if one had a set of glasses which would identify where the holes were, how far they were away. <laughs> could, could we do it? <laughs> <laughs> I think we're way off from that. Again, just to stress that. <laughs> At the tech right now, we're just at the stage where we can analyze one photo at a time, and it's sort of very specific, uh, very specific things. That said, never say never, mm -hmm. and you never know when things like that will, will enter the realms of the possible. Another question down at the front here. There's a microphone coming to you. Just the, yeah, yeah, there's a microphone coming. Thank you. I loved your um, last example of a design that you were working on. So I'm wondering what the status and stage of that is, when it's going to be actually commercialized so other people with visual impairment could actually have this wonderful glasses that you were working on, and also what the pricing of that is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it is very much a research project, and it's very easy to get things working in a lab. But then it maybe takes a long time before you can get that working in the general case and making things into a product, you know, could take even, I don't want to put any time, but you know, even possibly years, who knows. So it, I'm excited where the tech is going, but I must stress that, you know, like some of the other technology I showed, these are prototypes in a lab, not products today, unfortunately. But I'm going to keep working on this and I'm optimistic for the future. Uh, question over there. I'm going to pass the microphone over. Um, brilliant speech. You mentioned towards the end that it's um, rather nice if you can get people with issues together with people that can solve those issues. 
And I wonder to what extent the university, and this is perhaps more a question for the, uh, the disability group, to what extent the university are prepared to put together hackathons, workshops, making stuff, and bringing together all of those people. It's wonderful that Microsoft do it, but you have a limited resource, and in fairness, a limited number of people, whereas the university has an enormous resource and global reach. Richard is going to answer yeah. that one. <laughs> it's a question, I think, for the university, perhaps, rather than university, for... Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I think Microsoft has got a fair amount of resources. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very, very good question, yeah, so, and it's one, I don't know if there's anyone here from the yeah. computing department. Um, I was just going uh, to answer, we're, I mean, I don't know terribly a lot about it, but we do have them at the computer lab, mm. so there are hackathons and things, and if the gentleman is interested, we can find out more and pass it on, so the university is actively involved in things like that, good to know. but I'm sure there's more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Right, there was a question here. Thanks, it's the first person who asked the, the first question again about technology. So uh, I did go to a talk, I think by Richard Ladner, who was working on a, an app that you, could, that you could use Mechanical Turk through Amazon to describe using humans to try to describe pictures. So the downside to that, of course, is that you need a data connection and it costs some money. Do you think your app would be complementary to that? Do you see it as kind of going beyond that? Could you integrate that in some way? Absolutely complementary. So there are a number of apps, two or three that I know of specifically, which are what we call crowdsourced. So this is where there's a human at the other end. So you take a photo, and instead of having a computer describe, and I think, I think that's really useful today. Having artificial intelligence do that just makes it more scalable when there's not a human available, or maybe in the future. Again, a lot of this is research, so, in the f so I think we need to go down this route. And in the future, they might be able to do different things and availability. There's also the whole uh, privacy that sometimes you might not want something going out to a stranger on the internet. So I think they're definitely complementary. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, yep, there's one just there. Uh, I'm working with CamSight to do a three-dimensional crossword for blind people. Has anyone done it yet? Then I can stop working on it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I want one. <laughs> and no, I've not heard of anyone doing uh, three-dimensional crosswords. But yeah, get in touch and I I'd love to see that. <laughs> I think there's, a, there's another question over there. Hi there. Uh, I'm a man with a grey beard, just so you can picture it. Um, <laughs> I was recently at a meeting of the British Assistive Technology Association, which brings together many of the uh, manufacturers and developers of those um, specialised and bespoke uh, softwares and, and hardwares in the past. And... Uh, colleague of yours from Microsoft was at that meeting and I would have to say that as he described what Microsoft's intentions now were there was this kind of roller coaster of emotions in the room I think uh, in which the bespoke uh, developers saw their business model going up in smoke and then the sudden realization that they might become millionaires by selling out to Microsoft <laughs> um, I was just wondering how you were working with people outside of Microsoft um, so that you're not reinventing the wheel first and foremost, but also so that um, the people who have spent many years working in these kind of technologies also get a fair crack of the whip or their, their dues of what they've been achieving. I'm not sure that I can speak to that specific situation, but I do know that my colleagues in Microsoft are always working with the assistive technology vendors and those communities. And, and I, again, I don't know any more specifics than that, but we definitely want to collaborate and work with those companies too. 
Oh, there's a question right at the back right there. Hello, I'm a lady with long hair wearing glasses <laughs> and I'm sitting down, I'm definitely not jumping on a skateboard. Um, I'm really interested in the title of the talk about innovating for an inclusive future. And obviously we've seen some examples of what are possible in the videos that you showed. I'd really like to know where you see this technology and other types of innovation taking us in the future and paint us a picture of the inclusive future that you'd really like to see. Wow. Um it depends how far in the future, but I kind of want, I imagine this world, you see that things today like Siri, Cortana, all these sort of personal assistants as they're called. But right now, you know, they're just doing very basic tasks. I imagine this world where maybe I will have some kind of digital assistant, which is going to help me with, fill in the gaps with whatever my personal situation, I'm not explaining this well, but I can't see, so maybe it's going to help me with visual things. And this personal assistant is going to help someone who can't hear with auditory things. And I guess I look at this way where you're going to have artificial intelligence which just supplements everyone's abilities. And that's not just for people with what you'd call, you know, let me call it traditional disabilities, but everyone's different. Everyone has something they can't do. And so I imagine this world of artificially intelligent assistants which just fill in for you and level the playing field. And that really is just a far off dream. It'd be amazing to live there. I agree, thank you. All right, I think we've got time for one or two more questions and there's a hand going up more or less straight ahead of us. Um, hi, um, I'm um, another guy with a grey beard. Um, <laughs> um, I've been um, fascinated to hear about um, how um, technology can um, provide speech. Um, I have a stammer myself, um, and um, one of the things, um, one of the uh, manifestations of my stammer is that um, I get a block and I cannot say the word that I want to say. Um, I'll be fascinated to know um, how technology can actually provoke speech and can actually um, stimulate the vocal cords to say the word that uh, we want to say. That would be great. And again, I'm sure there are... I don't, there may well be researchers out there working on this. I don't know very specifically about this field. Um, but I hope that we can have technology to help with that too. Right. One more question. I think there was, there was one just next to the other chat. Hi, I'm a middle-aged guy in a suit. Um, <laughs> <coughs> I wonder what role you see for driverless cars as assistive technology. I'm really excited about driverless cars myself. No more delays on trains. <laughs> <laughs> but more seriously, yes, as a, someone who's visually impaired and can't drive or, you know, for many other disabilities, it's going to be incredibly useful. So I really look forward to the day when driverless cars are, are here. But then you're also going to need to solve many other problems. And I hope that the people making driverless cars consider those too. Um, you know, for example, if there's no human behind the wheels then of a taxi, then who's going to help you get in and out? Or if the car gets stuck somewhere, then who's going to tell you why it got stuck or what's happening? So I hope that I'm looking forward to driverless technologies, and I hope that they consider all the assistive angles too. I think we have to end the, the formal questions here, because I believe, as ever, there are drinks through in, in, the, in the room where you probably came in. Um, but I'm sure Saqib will be available for informal questions for anyone who still has burning questions to ask. So can we just thank Saqib again for a fascinating talk. <laughs>